Hi, and welcome to another edition of Newsmakers Journal of the Vaccine Year. It is Friday, May 21st. I'm Jerry Roberts, and uh, we have a special old men shouting at clouds edition today because I'm uh, very pleased to welcome back a friend, uh, uh, Pat McElroy, a community hero and very influential uh, behind the scenes uh, civic leader, uh, former fire chief. How you doing, Pat? I'm not getting hero paid, Jerry, so I don't know. You know? <laughs> well, we can get into that. So yeah. first of all, what what was with this fire on TV Hill last night? I mean, what are you hearing uh, from um, I, I would, I'm just, as I'm a civilian now, I'm just hearing what everybody else is hearing. It's, it's uh, that used to be a really common occurrence on, on TV Hill because oh, yeah? of the homeless encampments. There were some really big homeless encampments, well-established ones up there. But when the dryers took over, uh, they worked with our then fire marshal, uh, John Key Wilkinson, and that property had been really, really well-maintained over the last, uh, oh, I want to say 20 years. And um, so it's unusual, but that used to be, people have been around here a long time have seen that. For, for, um, for me last night, I think um, the rapid spread yeah. Due to the wind was a huge problem. And the wind was also a factor in them not being able to use helicopters. Because uh -huh. normally you go to the top, the bottom, and then you stop the lateral spread if you can with the helicopters before committing people on the ground there. And they were just unavailable because of the weather last night. So um, it'll be interesting to see what they, what they find. It's obviously not a natural cause. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't like there was lightning in the area or something else. So it, it's, it'll be interesting to see what they're finding about the, the uh, source of the ignition. Well, I'm reading, I mean, everywhere in the state uh, that's, you know, even semi-urban that, you know, the uh, homeless encampments, fires at homeless encampments are just uh, becoming more and more uh, of, a, of an issue. Well, it's true here. I mean, just, it's, it's true here. You, you, if you look at, you know, almost all fires um, are human ignition. I mean, people cause fires, whether you know, innocently or mali uh, maliciously, uh, human activity causes fire. That's why the wildland fire problem is growing so much in the United States is because there's more people living out in what used to be called the wildland urban interface. It's now really an intermix. And um, so human activity, cooking, driving, smoking, um, all of those things, uh, just the lives we, we lead and the activities we have um, are the source of a lot of, a lot of fires. And then, um, and you have this many people living on the street right now, all the unsheltered people right now, um, there's going to be more of those types of fires because they are doing all of those things, cooking, um, smoking, all of those things um, in a setting with a lot, not a lot of safety um, afforded to them. So you're going to see these things. By the way, I've got some puppies here. So if you hear some barking there. Oh yeah, I, I do too. Henry's here. So he, he yeah. usually chimes in at some point with it. Yeah, they're chasing he, birds right now. So it anyway. makes like an Alfred Hitchcock cameo appearance usually. All right. So we were talking, uh, and uh, the reason I wanted you to come on the show, uh, so the city council is, uh, having its budget hearings now. And uh, I know there's an item of particular importance to you that you're concerned uh, might get uh, overlooked or killed, uh, you know, in our rush to uh, have uh, Medicare for all or uh, some other uh, federal policy. They might lose sight of this, uh, but uh, it's a communications item. But, it, you know, pretend I don't know anything about the uh, physics of a radio wave transmission or the time space continuum or the universe. Not a big leap, Jerry. Yeah, uh, and just <laughs> explain explain what it is. Okay, it's actually, actually not in this budget, but it needs to be addressed um, by August and September at the latest to move forward where it will then be part of the 2023 or 24 budget. Um, I got interested in a lot of these technical issues when I, um, due to a death of a friend of mine's daughter, um, I got drawn into how 911 and cell phones work. So there's all these technical things that have happened since we've been doing the standard firefighting, um, or I used to do uh, 
standard fire response. And some of these things are, in, are primarily technical in nature, like with the cell phones, it was the assumption that everybody has is that when you call on your cell phone, that operator knows where you are. And that the actually nine, the 911 operator. 911 operator, and that's not true. And but if you're in a world where your Uber driver knows where you are and Domino's knows where you are, the, the fact that the 911 system doesn't know where you are because of how calls are routed in the 911 system um, is something that most people just aren't aware of. So the uh, emergency systems communication thing has not really kept up with we haven't, advances we in haven't, we haven't kept it kept up with it and and the term i use for it it's infrastructure it's truly infrastructure because that's it's it's as much infrastructure the communications as a fire station or a fire truck because that is the connection between us and somebody who's calling um the public safety so and the fact that the that the 911 operator doesn't know where you are when you call but there is a solution for this uh, yes and what is it well, what, that, that still will always be a piece of it. I'll give you an example that just recently happened. Um, Joyce Dudley, who told me I could go ahead and talk about this, our, our district attorney. Her very close friend uh, was uh, on a bicycle going under the Hot Springs overpass, the, where Cabrillo turns into Hot Springs, and was hit by a hit and run driver coming off the freeway. So a they call 911. Um, he calls Joyce and says, I've been in this accident. And so she goes to the scene. She gets there and nobody's shown up yet. So it's right at this perfect intersection where there's the CHP because it's on the because it's on the freeway, I guarantee you that call went to Ventura County, to Camarillo, to the CHP dispatch center, um, and then would be transferred to the appropriate secondary dispatch center in Santa Barbara County, which in that case, could be Montecito fire, could be Santa Barbara City fire. But the end result was they're still waiting for somebody to show up there two months later. And, and so they, they, Joyce finally got on the phone and spoke to a dispatcher and said, uh, you know, what's going on? Is somebody coming? Yes. Well, from where? And who is it? I can't tell you that. So, not be, not because it's confidential, but because she can't. She doesn't know. Doesn't know. She doesn't know. So she passed, like, it on, she passed it on, and she doesn't know where it is in the system now. So, okay. So that gets to our the okay that you have the trouble with the the nine one one call going to the wrong location because of the way that the historical um, rules were set up in the 19, late 1960s, which is amazing because Lyndon Johnson was president when the 911 system started. And so at that time in California, what did, what did you have maybe 5,000 car phones, usually military or government or something like that. Or, so, or Hollywood yeah. producers. Yeah, and now, um, now you've got 40 million phones. So it was a system that was set up then still um, responsive to that type of load? Well, it is. And it needs to be corrected, and and it is in the process of being corrected. We put forth a bill with uh, Assembly uh, Member Williams, it was unanimous, unanimously uh, approved by the Assembly Senate and signed by Governor Brown. So, I know that they have a friend of mine's son who lives in Minnesota is working on California's 911 system. His his company has the contract to look at the 911 system. So I know that's happening. So what is this particular expenditure that, that we were talking about, this $750,000? Is, what is that designed to address locally? Okay, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of a history there. there um, we've been look, looking at this and I'm talking about that as when I was in my former capacity as, as a fire chief about over a decade we started talking about regional dispatch and the, the barriers in the way. The first barrier was we had to be um, okay with um, not being territorial about, that's my call, you can't take my call. These border disputes where county jurisdiction and city jurisdiction rub up against each other. The same with Montecito and us and Montecito and Carpinteria. So currently in the county of Santa Barbara, 
there are five dispatch, municipal dispatch centers, Santa Maria, Lompoc, County of Santa Barbara, um, actually Lompoc is handled by them, I believe, but uh, Carpentry of Montecito and the city of Santa Barbara. Our goal, the chief's goal, when, when we started it, and now the goal of the current group of chiefs is to have one common dispatch center. Um, because right now, if a dispatcher is working the city of Santa Barbara's dispatch center, they can see where all of our engines are. The new technology there is AVL, which is automatic vehicle locator. And so it can put, you can show you, show the dispatcher where separate engines are in the city. Because during the day, in the course of a day, engines are moving all of the time for training or for move ups or whatever. And really just looking at where the fire station located is located isn't accurate. One of the things I've said is that a fire station is where a fire engine goes to sleep at night. The rest of the time they're, they're generally out, out moving around. Um, so if say, for example, there's a, um, a medical emergency at the Montecito Inn on Coast Village Road, city of Santa Barbara. So the city of Santa Barbara is gonna send an engine, but Montecito through automatic aid will also send an engine as well. Montecito so, fire. Yeah, because you don't know, that city dispatcher cannot see where the Montecito engine is. And so you send two just to make sure that somebody arrives. You get that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So but the now, original call would still go to CHP probably? It conceivably could, yeah. So, so what we're trying to do is what they're doing, what they have been doing for a long time in Ventura County. You have one dispatch center, you, you close the other dispatch centers and locate in one place. The county has offered um, a space for that facility to be where county OEM is. So you would have dispatchers and because of the AVL locate, as it is right now, Montecito can see their engines, Carpinteria can see their engines, we can see our engines, the county can see their engines. But what if we have one common dispatcher, that dispatcher can see everybody. And, and this you know, is yeah. not, I mean, this is not brain science, right? I mean, no. like, you no, know, Domino's is doing it, Uber does it. Uber and, does it. And, and the thing is now it's just, we need to stop being territorial and realize that the force multiplier this is um, for each agency and, and thus every citizen. And it doesn't matter. This affects you whether you're rich or, or unsheltered, wherever you are, this is going. This is going to help you, if you if you have an emergency. So, for example, knowing what I know about when I used to work for the city, what that means for the city of Santa Barbara is we have our seven stations in, inside of the city. Then there's also a county station at Mission Canyon, county station on Hollister by the uh, Page Center, and Montecito Station at, at Sycamore Canyon. They're now to, part of our response with this system, because the dispatcher will be able to go, well, it says engine four, but it, I can see engine 15 is a block away. So that's why I'm sending. Okay, so not only do they get there quicker for you with one call, you make one call, they get there quicker, um, that other engine doesn't have to go. So it remains in service. So you're still, you're keeping all of these things moving as efficiently as possible. The other choice is to build more fire stations and hire more people. This eliminates the need to do that. So instead of having to build, I think the newest station proposed in the county, station 10, is about $7 million for construction. And then to staff it is about three, $3.2 million a year. Annually, right? Annually, okay. And so this allows you a much more efficient system that utilizes all of the agencies that are in place right now through the mutual aid system. And that dispatcher will be able to dispatch the closest um, available resource to the person is it doesn't matter what color the engine is, what kind of patch they wear, who's going to get to that person first. And so that's the that's the that's the, the important thing behind it. Now, what does that mean? for the city of Santa Barbara in terms of cost. Well, the South Coast between all of the agencies 
runs over 20,000 calls for service annually. Okay, so that's a, that's a big volume, which would be able to be handled with this one center that only does fire and EMS. Um, the, um, the city would, as the city's, the, the county is bearing the cost of the construction. The county's, you know, it's, there's, you don't have to, we're not gonna have to acquire land. Uh, they're, they're, this, this has been worked on for a while. I don't know the details that Chief Hartwig um, has been working on. And um, this will allow so much uh, better service for, and the city of Santa Barbara's piece would be about $750,000 dollars a year. And what that is, is for five full-time dispatchers who will no longer be lead needed at the combined police fire dispatch in the city of Santa Barbara, they will work now for this, this agency um, at, this com at this communication center, dispatch center um, in the county. So their, so their salaries and benefits are already being fun paid for us so. they're, they're already they're in the budget right now and and so all you're doing is it's and if you look at it it's it's five full-time positions looking at the high cost of um uh hundred and fifty thousand dollars for total compensation that uh that retirement benefits all of that stuff that's the seven hundred fifty thousand is is five positions all right is so, there an, is there a name for this thing um it's a it's a combined um it's a fire DM fire EMS dispatch center. All right. Okay. And so um, the uh, to me, it's we we get caught up in all these issues, but we find ourselves caught up in this crazy, frustrating stuff that council gets caught up in. This is a no-brainer. I mean, this is you're gonna help everybody in this community including the tourists, including people that are passing through, everybody's gonna have improved level of service for a relatively small cost. It doesn't, it doesn't boost salaries. It doesn't add any uh, perks to anybody else. It's exactly the way it is now. It's more efficiently distrib distributed and um, or distributed and, and, and the funding, um, everybody, everybody takes some responsibility for that. And so now, from county line to county line, you are going to be getting the best and closest service, you know, when you call 911. But wow. if the city of Santa Barbara, see, CARP, CARP's board has already passed this. Montecito's board has already passed this. The county's waiting for Santa Barbara uh, and Santa Maria to jump in and then, and then they're ready to go. But say if you build a system that doesn't include Santa Barbara, and there's recent experience to this. So you'll have Montecito, Carpinteria, this big hole where Santa Barbara doesn't participate, and then the county. Well, it doesn't bridge. Those things don't connect. It doesn't work. It, this is like a once you know, in a generation opportunity, and we need to, Santa Barbara's got to commit to it before the end of the summer or it goes away. And council needs to focus on stuff like this. Because this yeah, is- Yeah, let me, yeah, that's a good point. I. I mean, I should say, uh, uh, I guess in the interest of disclosure, you know, when I came to town in 2002 to uh, be the editor of the local uh, morning newspaper, the first person that called me uh, to, you know, just kind of introduce himself and meet was Pat. And uh, you, I think you were uh, the head of the firefighters union at the time. Uh, uh, I was a union union thug. Yeah. Yeah. You were a union. And the only, so, you, I mean, you've seen this all from both sides, but uh, you know, it just, it, that in itself told me a lot about, you know, your political savvy and kind of understanding the way things actually work. And I think you make an excellent point about council being focused on a lot of other stuff um, rather than this is know, kind of practical, day-to-day -day things that act, that are, don't have anything to do with party or partisanship or or anything else. Um, this is a winner. This is a winner for every voter in the city of Santa Barbara, no matter what your point of view. Um, it's how how are you going to argue with this? It's going to make you safer when you have a problem. Somebody's going to come faster, and yeah. and we're going to be able to say if Joyce Dudley calls up dispatch and says where's my fire engine they'll say it's on bass street headed your way 
yeah. you know, you, you'll be able to do that. Right now, they're sitting there going, I don't know. You know, I'm not yeah, sure. It could be in Ventura. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. Because especially if, if um, look, look at the, the practical realities of things that are going on right now. Every day, every afternoon, Southbound 101 is a mess, okay? But from Milpa Street on, okay? So our engine is right off Milpa Street. Or the city's engine is right off Milpa Street. Coast Village Road is our jurisdiction. At that time of day, are we the best person to go there? Yeah. yeah. No, because Montecito can just go straight down um, Hot Springs Road and, and get to Coast Village Road or, or, or Olive Mill Road and, and get there. And that this takes all of that stuff out of the way because you can sit there and go, well, look at where they're coming from and you, and you, make, the, you make the selection on that. All and, right, well, uh, thank you. It's, for, it's for... Not, and another thing is that there's dispatch, it, there are hard positions to fill. The, 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 the city has been chronically understaffed and dispatched. I think they have funding for 18 full-time dispatchers. And I, and I think they've only got about six or seven. And the other thing is you have officers, you have, you have police officers who are dispatching now because they can't, they can't fill those seats. So would you rather have a police officer on the street or in the third floor of the Granada garage dispatch? All right. Okay, but I, I, wa I wanna back up and, and talk about the politics of this just a little bit. Um, uh, I, I mean, everybody knows you're, you're uh, with uh, Randy Rouse in the, uh, in the mayor's race. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Randy's message, uh, the, you know, sort of the criteria of his candidacy is, you know, what, it, that the whole city hall has become so partisan and, and particularly, you know, with the Democratic Party endorsement that people tend to forget these are nonpartisan jobs and what people lack counsel to do is stuff like this, you know, not to hold forth on all of the great issues of the day. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, kind of what you've seen uh, at City Hall and all the time that you've been involved, which is decades, of course, uh, and kind of where we are now and how City Hall is operating or not? Um, I, I can only speak from my, my perspective. I knew that when, when I first got involved in 80, 1982. Um, our thing was we just wanted somebody to talk to us, <laughs> and and you had you had at every everybody was at large, and so as the decades proceeded to win in a city election, um, you had to get about eight thousand votes. You know that's that's what it it took. The current council, all six of them. Um, are there with 8,900 votes total, all six offices, 8,900 votes total. And they range from a high of uh, 3,237 in one district to zero in another. Right. Yeah, and then there's others that are, uh, the totals, let's see, they got uh, 538 votes, 963 votes, um, zero votes. Uh, 3,200, 2,750. Wow. Wow. Henry, Henry, it's okay. So understanding the the intent of district elections, um, the diversity and representation of the community, I, under, I understand that, but getting a smaller and smaller uh, electorate with a, with uh, Henry in these, in, in, in these districts, in the district races. And, and what, what I get concerned about with that is if I was still involved in this, I would sit there and go, you can really make an impact with some well-placed dollars and some organization. Well, that's what the Democratic Party is though. I mean, yeah. the, every one of the, and, and the mayor who's the only person remaining who runs at large doesn't have to get a majority of votes. I mean, no, that, I think it was I think twenty seven percent last 27%. time. Twenty seven percent. I mean, that's crazy. And, and in that in that same election, Measure C, uh, which I was a, a part of, had twenty four thousand people vote on that. Fourteen thousand uh, that we, we won with fourteen thousand votes. So um, that, and there were like ten thousand against it. But that was a representative sampling of how the people of Santa Barbara felt, you know, and and I think in some of these 
other races, it's it's not. It's well, not, and, 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 the, and other, I mean, the other thing is the, the, the Democratic Party is the one that gets, you know, identified quickly. But the other thing is there's there's a opportunity for people with not such benign interests to have an outsized influence and have have a financial um, backing to a, to a candidate that becomes so necessary that they have, they have an outside vote, outs, outsized vote with that particular candidate. Well, yeah, and, and, and the other thing that happened, and I know uh, Randy, is, uh, his head explodes when he talks about this, is because you convinced him to go out there and campaign for, for Measure C. And, and he said, you know, people say, oh, this is just a thing for the unions. And he said, no, no, it's not for the unions. And then what did the council turn around to do in about 12 seconds is yeah. you know, put, put the project labor agreement on it. So all of this infrastructure money or you know, over a certain level of, of project uh, has to be uh, go through the union hall. But it was, well, I know an interesting part of that, see, was um, I was concentrating on the public employee unions for the city of Santa Barbara, police, fire, SCIU, that this is not going to benefit them. This is not going to benefit them. And I spent a lot of time with uh, union people in, in those groups to, to sit there and say, we, you, you need to support this because if it's, it's going to make your work environment better, it's going to make the city safer, better and all that. There's nothing in it for you personally. And we got them all to support it. And then the thing's over and they give it to, to uh, everybody but them. Yeah. So it, it, it was it, it was surprising and, and and one more point on that uh, b before we go back to this this uh, regional dispatch center and that's the correct term for it, regional dispatch is this is in terms of Measure C and in terms of the twenty one or twenty two million dollars that the city is just going to get from the federal government this regional dispatch center is infrastructure it's public safety infrastructure and. When I hear people talking about spending $90 million to redo 10 blocks of State Street using Measure C money, that makes me go crazy because it's like, well, I don't think that's what the 14,000 people voted for. They wanted better streets, better sidewalks, all of that stuff. Public uh, safety. A police station uh, built. I didn't say anything about bike lanes on State Street in, in that particular project. So Neon I, I think there's a much... There's much more, there is a much more valid place for council to find a reason to fund this once they, once they realize this is really infrastructure. The in, no, it's, no. it's the infrastructure that connects a citizen to their services for emergencies. All right, so, so let's talk about what's going on at City Hall a little bit. And uh, I, I do want to get back to the council and what they're really focused on, but you... Uh, we had this LA Magazine story uh, come yeah, out, uh, I guess about a month ago now. And, uh, you know, it was supposed to be a big blockbuster about corruption involving marijuana licenses and so on and so forth. And you were quoted uh, in uh, Nick Scow's column in the Montecito Journal this week. Uh, you said, it, speaking of the piece, it was designed to damage reputations. Unfortunately, it appears to have been successful. What it would, what did you mean specifically by that? I always love that Mark Twain quote, um, a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is still putting its shoes on, you know? And this is a classic example of that. What, <laughs> and there's a lot of good reporters in town that I know are looking at this and I can't wait to see when they, when they come out with it, uh, how this story was set up, how this story was delivered, how the material ended up in the hands of Mitch, Mitch Kriegman to write, write this piece. Um, the, uh, when you look at the, at the piece is who stood to benefit from linking all of these things together? So it's an it's attack on uh, Anthony, attack on- Anthony Wagner, the former- Anthony brother. Wagner, attack on Chief Luno, attack on uh, Paul Casey. And that's the thing. The me, the, the me, the, the the glaring thing is isn't who got the dispensary license. It's who didn't get. It. 
whose ox was gored in that thing? And, and what were they gonna do about it? And um, it's, <laughs> I, I can say this, and I don't wanna say much more because I don't wanna impact anybody's legal case uh, down the road. But if you're plotting something like this, it's best not to do it in a bar or a restaurant where other people are there because that's the kind of stuff that happened. There's, there's people that are going, you can't believe what I heard at, at Finney's last night or what I heard um, at some place, any place. But if you don't realize <laughs> that you're a public figure in a public place talking about stuff or texting stuff to big lists or emailing stuff to big lists about who you're gonna take out, you don't realize that you're leaving a trail. Well, the city, so the city hired somebody to do an investigation of this yeah. and, and, you know, said, no, Anthony, you know, it came up clean and uh, none of it's true, but it really didn't go into how this all came about. No, they, know, looked, they, were looking, they were looking at one particular thing, that the, the application of that license. But and you're saying out, that there were people who, who stood to benefit from this. Of course uh, they did. And, and it's and it's there were people high ranking people in administrative posts in the city of Santa Barbara openly talking in public about um, where everybody would end up if he got rid of Paul. How would that advance my career? How would I end up here? And what if we get rid of George Buell first and then Anthony Wagner next? And you know, Chief Luno just got tired of the whole thing and 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 left. And then it was, you know, let's get rid of Paul. And, and that's where you hear this talk about, um, you, two, things can't be, two things can't be true. You talk about everybody, everybody's talking about this council is just the worst ever, we've ever seen, but let's make them in charge of the city administrator. Let's, oh, let's you, flip, you, 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 flip you, you, this you, thing. Right. Let's flip, yeah. flip this thing from strong administrator, uh, weak mayor and councils to strong mayor and council and weak administrator. Well, Deborah Deborah Schwartz has made that argument, has advanced that argument in her well, it's, uh, mayoral and, campaign. And so as a local developer, that's been his his big deal is to, yeah, to have, have George, that. Yeah. 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 And so if you if you have an outsized influence in district elections by backing people, then you'll have an outsized voice if they're in charge of the administration of the city. And you and don't forget that these are term limited positions. So you're not gonna have somebody with decades of experience in running the city and supervising fire, police, public works in that office anymore. You can have a person who's got four years or if they get challenged you know, or if they get reelected eight years and then they're off to their, their next thing. So I just don't think it's healthy. And I, when I was in the, uh, in the union, um, I battled, head to head with Dick, Dick Thomas and Sandra Tripp Jones and Jim Armstrong. And I would be doing it with Paul right now too, but I never, I never thought that council, it was our job to influence council to on, on, as a union person on voting for things that we thought were, were important. But um, the only mayor that, um, What stands out to me is somebody like Harriet Miller. There you're sitting there going, that, that, "There's an executive. She could have, she could have maybe done that." But she knew she didn't want it. She knew it wasn't appropriate, and she never even talked about it. I just don't think it's it's. I don't think it's healthy. I, I know that people are going to disagree. I, I disagreed with all of the people I just mentioned about about different things, but I never thought they were um, corrupt. <laughs> They just had a different viewpoint than mine. They had a different way of doing things. But they go, all go, go back to Anthony for a minute. And sure. we both know him, and you know he's uh, he's got his flaws. I, I you know as a public servant, but I, I mean he just really got screwed in this thing, did he not? Yeah, and we all we all have flaws. Yeah. Uh, and, and guess what? Um, this article ruined his life. And I'm not I'm not being um, dramatic about this. This ruined his life. And nobody cared if it was true or not. He was just roadkill. And, and it's, uh, it's been very detrimental to his wife and daughter who have left town 
over this. And, and so these are, these are, these are people that, you know, were trying to do what they thought was, was best. And, you know, it's not like Anthony was the pot czar. He was part of a team. He had one part of a five part uh, selection process where that he was responsible for. He wasn't moving all the chess pieces around to, to do that. And, and, um, but it didn't, people didn't care. The stuff about Chief Luno, when I first saw the article, which by the way, one of the things that fascinates me is an obscure public, you know, fairly obscure. It's not like LA Magazine's a standard go-to morning thing for Santa Barbara. But that morning, every damned email box in the city seemed to have had that thing dropped in it. So who had access to those type of lists? Who was ready? Who was sitting there waiting to go, okay, send. And because that's exactly what happened. It's exactly what happened. And um, the stuff about Chief Luno, you could just see how it was leaked, or not leaked, it was handed to Mitchell Kriegman. The, the every other, the, the three day weekends, every other weekend down in, in San Diego. Well, since the recession of 2008 9, Santa Barbara has been on a nine day, a 980 schedule. Everybody, that works a normal work schedule has a three day weekend every other weekend. It wasn't like she was the only one doing it and vacationing every all the time in her house in Coronado. Her house in Coronado was rented until the summer of 2019. There was just stuff that was really easily checked. Her salary, really easily checked. I did it, I went through that article in 10 minutes on Google. I, I was sitting there going, well, this is bullshit. This is bullshit. This is bullshit. This is bullshit. And, and, so, so why was it put together like that? You know, and, and the other thing is too, is like Anthony's background check. I was given though, I mean, I had access to those when, when I was in my position and you learn a lot about people that's extremely confident. This is, this is when you're applying for the job. There's a, there's an extensive background check for yeah. positions like yeah. as we Because you're going to, you're going to, you're going to pay a, a firefighter or, or a cop a lot of money over the course of their career, if they do a full career. So you wanna make sure there's not any skeletons in the closet, any behavioral problems, anything like that, that you, you're gonna to have to deal with um, at some point later in their capacity as, a, as an employee. But if I leaked that to anybody, I would expect to be fired. So where did that come from? I don't know. But if, 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 if details of a background investigation um, are shared, I know that I would, I would have been, if, if working for Jim Armstrong, uh, I would have not been surprised if he just called me and said, uh, turn, in your, turn in your stuff, you're done. Because it's, it's, a, it's a sacrosanct thing and you're, you're not to use that against somebody. So uh, somebody, somebody, somebody put that out there. And then the other thing that was similar, there was this, um, I don't know what it's called, a 360 management review or something that about Paul Casey, the city administrator, uh, which, you know, the, the, the released his, uh, the finding or, you know, whatever the characterization of his management style is as well. Those are pretty closely guarded as well, are they not? I don't know. I think, you know, I, I was never much on those exercises. I don't like going to conferences. I don't like going to conventions. I don't like playing parlor games, of that type of thing. So it, it, I don't know how confidential that would be, but it, 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 it um, in a strictly confidential sense, like a background check. But if you're in a room with a team and you're sharing things with each other about yourself, and how about how you feel uh, on stuff like that? On on a, on some level, it's a betrayal. It's a personal betrayal, and that's that's what I've I've uh, um, been um, dismayed to see is the uh, stunning disloyalty and um, and sandbagging of your of your peers or the the, t the team that you work with, the distrust that that that. Uh, has seemed to develop um, uh, in the city management team. Yeah, well, look, I mean, I'm a journalist, so I don't want to be in the position of saying people shouldn't leak stuff and there shouldn't be this information, you know, provided to journalists either. 
But your point is really more that it, uh, it, it, it wasn't, you know, sort of the result of this, you know, net that was spread wide to find out all kinds of things, but, but more of a, uh, of an opposite of an oppo research drop. Uh, it was a hit piece. Yeah. It was a hit piece. And now if you look at it, um, so, and so, don't forget, I mean, the last, I mean, the last time I was on this show with you was a year ago. Yeah. And Randy and I went, we knew this was happening. We knew this was happening. So unexpected, you know, so it was supposed to, and, and the other thing is kudos to Gwen Lurie for not publishing it. At the Monastery, Monastery, yeah. Right. yeah, because she just said, she and Nick were going, we can't, you know, we can't do this. We can't run this. And, and, um, but it was out there a year ago. But the, the thing is now, if you think of the people involved, when this article was being first looked at, who, were, who was public enemy number one was George Peele. Well, he's gone. Um, Anthony was always on somebody's, well, somebody's list. The other person they wanted to damage was Chief Luna. Well, she retires. So now she's not, by the time this article comes out, she's gone. So it's, it's uh, Anthony and, Anthony and, uh, or, and, and Paul. And, and Paul, Paul was probably the ultimate, ultimate uh target to be weakened you know and um that's well, the, it, it, the thing is too is it like people sit there and go now the new thing is well center always clears everybody that's total crap i mean i use center for background stuff I what, use is for, what, 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 what is that what is that is the company that did the investigation of of anthony and it's it's always got to be everybody's finding bamboo shoots in the in the ballots you know everybody's got to find if 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 an investigation clears somebody, go well. That was that's a corrupt investigation. Well, maybe it's just what it is. Yeah. Maybe it's just what it is. Well, to go back to your point about you know how the information all sort of came together. You know the the, the, the great you know the the Latin question, of course, qui qui, qui bono who yeah. who benefits from all this. I I'm gonna guess that you have some names in mind. But uh, uh, speaking of litigation, I, you probably yeah. want. Put that's why I'm hey, that's why I'm leaving it to the fifth estate. <laughs> okay. you know, I'm, I'm, de I'm depending on the fine journalists based in this town to 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 do this because it, and I'm serious. I, well, I on behalf of the I, court, I, I have to say I think we did pretty good. I mean, I I, I had a piece up uh, yeah. within 24 hours. I think Nick yeah. came in on it and uh, Josh, you know, who had reported on a lot of this stuff. Uh, yeah, Josh, Josh had this. Uh, Josh yeah. had this story nailed a long time ago. And I, I can't imagine how frustrating it was for a guy like Josh who re reported it and, and the, knew about the license it. transfer, which it seemed and, like and, the big deal in the thing. Yeah. yeah. And it knew it, uh, he knew it all along. And all of a sudden, you know, it's well, all these lazy local journalists. And we had to bring in our own Woodward Bernstein. Yeah, um, yeah. From Portugal to, to clear up the, the message that you guys obviously are too incompetent to investigate. Uh, All right, but, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not interested in I'm I, I my my fervent hope is now that all this stuff has happened that one of the journalists in town or the group of them will go well how did this thing come out how yeah. how did this um, well, you know, it, it might come out in litigation uh, as well. I mean, uh, there's definitely going to be there's definitely going to be litigation. There are some people around town who should be awfully nervous. Yeah, in terms of defamation uh, uh, suits and 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 things like that. Uh, yeah, and and if and if it's not a, it's not an un, um, it's not an answered question yet whether Anthony's job is still there. And, and if a person loses their means to support their family and their health care because somebody decided they were just a roadblock that they needed out of the way and ruining their life was the price of it, well, that's fine. Now you've, you, there's damages to that person. And, and it's besides just the, the, um, the fact that it was a chicken shit thing to do, it's, it's, uh, uh, there's now there's real damages. All right. All and right. the thing is too, like I said, like I said, 
I'm not an I'm not an investigative reporter, and I don't try to pretend one on in LA Magazine. But um, it uh, it's not like there's not snail tracks all over the place of where this where this came from, you know. But you know, it's 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 been a weird year, and and because of the the pandemic and an emergency declaration, you know, there, there's been all kinds of doors open that weren't open before. And a lot of people are getting stuff that they, they'd always wanted and, and uh, could never get. And um, so they're, they're, people are getting used to, to, to uh, people are taking advantage of a pandemic. Right. I mean, for me, for me, I think there's a lot of great stuff going on, but, um, <laughs> And there's some really great programs that's surrounding this issue, but was there really a bike crisis last year? I don't think there was a bike crisis. I had Rob Dayton I think ask him that very, uh, that very yeah. question. I think so. there was a restaurant crisis. There was a small business crisis, but I think bikers were okay generally. Well, I and you know I I've been whining about this for months. So the 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 one thing I, I I'm gonna take a small amount of credit for is they're they're changing the color of the neon paint from the intersections to forest green so there, there, there is that all right we we gotta we gotta go let me ask you one more thing take off your uh, uh political advisor hat uh for a second and put on your political analyst hat well, well how do you handicap the mayor's race at this point i think it's i think it's too early to tell i really do i i think that i think that they're um i i don't even want to to, to do that right now. I just think that there's a lot of stuff that's gonna happen as we emerge from the pandemic. Um, I think that there's, people have got to realize the, the entire electorate of this community. When you look about like say the 24,000 people that voted on measure C, there's a whole lot of people out there that their world is a lot bigger than nine or 10 blocks of State Street. Yeah, yeah. And so there's other issues like this, like this public safety issue, like um, the infrastructure issues with it, it, that um, are going on that at some point they're gonna go, when are you gonna start thinking about me? Well, that's gonna, right. Uh, and three out, of, three out of four voters voted for somebody other than the current mayor last time. So they're, I mean, there's a lot of people out there that don't have a voice. And I've seen this. I mean, I saw it a lot in San Francisco in, in several epic elections where, you know, particularly the people that are kind of bearing the freight for all this thing, that pay, paying the taxes, paying property tax and so on, just say, wait a minute, you know, who's, who's speaking for me on this? So I, I think that's going to be the central issue. Yeah, I, I think in it, in for, you know, I'm a, a lifetime Democrat. You know, I, I saw John Kennedy when, when I was nine years old, you know, I, I, I at the opening of a May company with Pat Brown and Torrance, you know, and when I was 15, I, I volunteered in a, a Bobby Kennedy uh, headquarters in Redondo Beach for um, the, the primary where, where he was killed. I mean, this has been part of my life, but um, you have to, I don't want to define everything I do um, any choice I make by um, the party that I'm in, especially for a city election or a school board election. A nonpartisan. Yeah, I don't want to be told that. I don't, as, a, and as, a, as an elected official, I don't want to be told that I can't vote for my mom, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's just, come on. Shout come out on, Eric really? Friedman. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, come on, really? All right, man, we got to leave it there. Uh, thank you uh, so much for bringing the uh, regional dispatch issue to our attention and it's uh, we'll, we'll we'll keep an eye on it and uh i always enjoy your insights and your thoughts on uh on local politics and uh, it's going to be an interesting year so uh oh, I, think, I, I think i i think i threw some gasoline and lit it on the bridge i just walked over so we'll see how things go we'll see how it plays all right yeah. brother thanks okay. so much take care yeah.